Thank you. I, I, I'm going to talk about um, fiscal policy, welfare policy, and government policy towards taxation and its relationship with the family. And normally this is viewed through a lens of um, how the government might do more things by expanding welfare, providing more um, uh, uh, childcare provision and this type of thing in order to aid families. And I, I think that's a rather reductionist way to think about things. Taxation currently is at its highest level, um, uh, well, more or less since the Second World War, more or less actually in, in peacetime history. Um, as recently as 2010, government spending was over half of national income. Now it's about 45% of national income. And I think there's a big question as to how problems one might see in society can be solved simply by more of um, uh, that same um, approach. Um, and indeed, I think government attempts, because they're very often well-meaning, things like universal credit, um, to uh, resolve uh, these problems, welfare policies often have precisely the opposite of the, um, uh, the uh, precisely the opposite effect of the original intention. Universal credit is a very good example of how to not solve poverty incredibly expensively. Now, until the outbreak of the First World War, um, the state was so little involved in economic and social life um, that the the idea of family policy would never really have arisen. Of course, the fundamental functions of the state, protecting property, defence, law and order, this type of thing, are fundamental for civil society and the family to thrive. But there's no such thing as family policy as such. But as the state became more involved in economic life, and especially after the Second World War when the welfare state um, took a, a, a large leap um, it, uh, uh, to become a much larger and more significant, um, it did so in a way uh, such that the family, rather than the individual, was the basis of almost all public policy. Um, and it was very clear that this was Beveridge's intention as well. And this should be important to Christians, indeed all people of, of goodwill, as, as Elizabeth has pointed out. The family is the earliest and most direct vehicle for socialisation, for cooperation, for sharing, for mutual reliance, and so on. It's the basic unit within society in which we share goods, uh, distribute income and um, experience what economists would call um, the division of labour. So whether you think of children or pensioners, elderly relatives in need of care, the two primary adults in a family, they all do different things in a the family, they all earn different amounts of money, some of them zero, um, and they then share um, incomes in the pursuit of the common goal of um, ensuring that the family flourishes. Indeed, you could say that they, um, they um, distribute uh, resources, uh, giving according to need and taking away uh, according to the ability um, to pay. You could say it's a little unit of communism, if you like, and in that sense you could argue that political communism is a heresy in the proper sense of a truth taken out of context, um, but because it's an attempt to try to apply to the country as a whole something uh, where the natural domain uh, is, the, um, is the family. Now, unfortunately, public policy since really the 1970s, 1960s, probably the 1970s, has come to begin to discriminate against family formation and to do so quite uh, decisively. And this has been um, a move which has been promoted by all political parties and all um, philosophies. So, for example, this is Harriet Harman and Patricia Hewitt um, uh, writing in a, a book for the IPPR in 1990. Uh, they argue that the th uh, traditional ways of thinking about the family thwart the ability of women alone to provide adequately for themselves and their children. Hewitt was Minister for Women and Harman Secretary of State for Work and Pensions in the Blair government. But it was the Conservative Party, of course, that um, chose to remove the family basis for taxation in the late 1980s. And in doing so, Nigel Lawson was cheered on by um, well-off Tory women activists, I remember seeing it on telly actually, people who, wouldn't have crossed, who would cross the, um, to the, go to the other side of the road to avoid um, passing Harriet Harman on, on the pavement. And it's true also that, that people of the, um, uh, um, philosophically, people of the left have essentially joined with individualistic libertarians in promoting the idea that the basic unit um, of organisation within society is, in the is the individual and not the family. And 
those particular reforms that have taken place since the 1980s have led family formation to be discriminated against very strongly within the tax and welfare system taken together. So the combination of levying tax on an individual basis and providing welfare, based, uh, welfare benefits on the basis of family income lead um, to uh, family formation be discriminated against financially and in a significant way and especially for the least well off. So if two adults, for example, uh, let's say a mother and father who previously uh, lived apart, uh, move into the same home together, one of them is earning 25,000 a year and the other 11,000 a year, not, a, not an untypical situation, there's no change at all in their tax bill, actually a tiny change because of the, trans the small transferable allowance, but a significant reduction in the amount of benefits that they receive. Other parts of the tax system, such as the withdrawal of benefits, um, stamp duty on second homes, doesn't affect that many people, but both of those things discriminate strongly against family formation. So, Nick Clegg once told us that he opposed the um, introduction of transferable tax allowances, which is something that Nigel Lawson actually wanted to bring in when, um, in, when tax was individualised, on an individualised basis, but Mrs Thatcher stopped him, and Nigel Lawson is today a very strong proponent of transferable allowances. Nick Clegg argued that we shouldn't have transferable tax allowances, we shouldn't have um, a family basis for taxation because we shouldn't discriminate in favour of certain types of family organisation. This misses the point entirely. The uh, government taxation and fiscal policy discriminate strongly against family formation as if somehow family formation is a bad thing and it needs to be uh, penalised or discouraged uh, in some way. And we're quite unusual um, in the UK in taking that approach. Nearly all developed countries in some way have a tax and a welfare system which operate on a consistent basis uh, in, and in, normally by levying tax on the basis of family income rather than individual income and, and do so uh, in a way that discriminates much less against family formation than our own um, system. So the purpose of the state is to serve the family and not the other way around. I may have some things to say about things like name, person, and all the rest of it, if that uh, comes up. Because uh, there are other respects in which I think this relationship has become inverted. But the purpose of the state when it comes to fiscal policy should be to have a, 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 an approach to fiscal policy which allows the family to thrive and not to penalise it. Um, it's my strong belief, it would have been Beveridge's strong belief, and I think it should be the strong belief of all Christians and people of goodwill. Whatever your view about the sort of issues which uh, Elizabeth mentioned at the beginning, about how we define uh, family life uh, and so on, that tax and welfare policy should be rebalanced to ensure that that primary vehicle for welfare, which is the family, is supported uh, rather than penalised through the fiscal system.